intuition is to go sit in a cafe with a pen and paper and you just start drawing the people in the cafe. Do you know? And just be like, oh, there's a man, there's a woman. And then you'd be like, oh, it feels like there's some like, oh, tension going between their hearts and you can draw the tension in. Um, maybe you can feel their little child pulling at their energy field. Um, then you might get, you know, you might feel the waiter's energy and you might feel that the waiter's in love with someone, but there might be a crazy love going on. So you draw this stuff. And actually when you start sitting there drawing, drawing, drawing out all the impressions that you're feeling, by the end of 10, 20 minutes, you're like, wow, actually I picked up a lot of information here. Do you know? Because we don't realize how much information we're picking up. But this is really important to, to do so you recognize that. And you can go do that if you want to. Go, go hang out with a tree and draw the energies of the trees or the flowers and see if you can feel the subtle, the subtle energies that are, that are playing out. And this is one of the quickest ways to develop uh, intuition. Um, for sensuality, uh, you know, the simplest way is just to do free dancing, like just really get in touch with your, your sexual energy. So you might want to put your mind into your womb space or whatever and just allow the sexual energy to exist. You know, one of the ways you can do is just let it move through your body. And so a lot of the undulation movements that we get in belly dancing is actually just letting the sexual energy ripple through. So just practicing wave-like movements through your body and letting the spine snake will actually just cultivate the, the sexual energy to start moving up. And then you might actually feel sexual energy moving through your heart chakra, which can be really beautiful. So, yeah, dancing is a very um, simple thing. And imagination. Wow. What can I say about that one? Um, well, because I've got a four-year-old daughter. I just rediscovered <laughs> it, actually. I was like, oh, my God, I forgot about this imagination world. I remember that when I was a kid. And you could just have, like, I don't know, like a green straw, and it turned into something else, and you were right there, and, you know, the universe and the world shifted around you. Um, so if you don't have a four-year-old, um, what, <laughs> yeah, what can I suggest about imagination? I think it's just, you know, I think there's this common word now, imagineering, you know, and I think yeah. if you just, yeah, just think of something in your life and it could be as simple as like, I want to be, you know, I want to become an entrepreneur and I want to have an online business. And you just want to imagine it. And then what will happen? Okay, I can have an online business and I can employ people. And you just keep building up the imagination without letting your critical mind take over and go, well, you can't do that. You're not going to afford another person. Uh, you don't have the skill set. You know, if you become too successful, that you know, you might end up leaving your husband. So I can't do that. Do you know? So you've got to practice imagineering without letting the critical mind take over. And, and that can be really powerful because what it does then is it opens up your brain to uh, move beyond the impossible and to start waking up to what is potentially infinitely possible for you. So, yeah. 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 Oh, thank you. I like that. I want to go back to a couple of those things. I love the idea about just drawing things because there's no judgment on that. And that kind of ties into the imagination too. You're not being graded. It's not like you're going to go up to these people and say, is this accurate? You're just allowing it to move through and allowing to trust. It, it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. It's the fact that you are noticing. And then at some point in your life, if you're doing it with somebody where you could say, is this accurate? I bet most people will be right on with most of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're so, when, when we forget how in tune we really, really are. So, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Because I know just from talking to people in daily life, it's so common for people to say, I had a feeling I shouldn't have driven down that road or I had a feeling about that. But we don't honor those feelings. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's so important. We need to start honoring those feelings. We need to start recognizing that they're true and that they're correct. Or just even going, oh, I've got a feeling. Let me just take some time to explore it. Do you know, so often we have that feeling and our logical mind or our judgmental mind or our ego mind goes shook over the top and then that feeling just disappears and they're off doing, do you know? So yeah. So giving that time just to explore that feeling of, you know, what if it was right, do you know? Right, right. I like that too because, again, there's no judgment on that. You're exploring it. You may choose to follow it. You may not choose but you've explored it and you've felt it in your body, which again kind of connects to that, whether it's sexual or sensual energy, it's 
feeling where you're feeling it in your body and how that works. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh yeah. And then jumping into the dance, all I have to say is yay. <laughs> because I, uh, uh, for, for my listeners, just in case you don't know, I'm sitting here all sweaty just because I got done with the dance class. So I'm doing this interview post dancing. And yes, I love dancing. I love that you talk about the undulations, the flow, the movement. Because for me, I, I love dancing and I'm very connected into that. But I know I have a tendency, and I'm guessing you do too, <laughs> of wanting to lock in. I don't know how to dance. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to move. And the second you just allow your body to move, oh my gosh, it takes over and it's beautiful and it feels so good. And nobody ever, 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 ever finished dancing to a song and said, well, I feel worse now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You always feel better. You always feel better. Absolutely. So do you, do you use dance in your daily life as a practice? Yeah. So some of the things that if I'm doing like a lot of computer work, sometimes you know, my work does involve a lot of com computer work. I don't have a lot of time to go to the gym or go out or go for a walk. I just stick on some good music and I do five minutes of intense free movement dance just to let the energy flow through. And then, you know, I get more clarity in my brain. I feel vibrant and then I can, you know, continue on in, in my workflow. So that, that's how I use the dance actually is as a freedom break and an energizing break and a, a vibrancy break and you know just a feel good feel good thing you know keep the serotonin levels high the adrenaline high so that you know we've got more energy to, to get on with the more mundane tasks <laughs> oh exactly I love that and you know for listeners who might be listening to this um, show as a radio show or a podcast and they're in their car or at their desk or whatever do some room circles you can be standing up, you know, it's like if you're thinking, woohoo, I feel that because I too do a lot of computer work and I'm sitting and sometimes I can't stand up, but I can sh still shimmy or circle and it helps. It always helps. Yeah, absolutely. Just to free the energy up because the energy is always moving through your body. Don't let it be stagnant. Let it, let it enliven you. That's what it's here to do. Oh, yeah. Now, you had mentioned a word in there that I definitely want to hook into, and that's theta, because I know you do the um, theta training, and as a hypnotherapist, I'm familiar with the theta waves, but for our listeners who are thinking, theta, what's that? So, could you explain what that is? Yeah, it's a super cool modality. I think there's like eight levels. So I teach like eight different levels. But the core of it is that you, first of all, you need to learn to get your brainwave into a theta state, which is a very slow brainwave uh, state. It's like, I think four to seven uh, cycles, of hertz per cycle or something, which is like the state just before sleep. Okay, so it's like a very slow brainwave state. It's a state that, you know, dream it. When you see someone dreaming, their eyes flicker, they're in theta. Hypnosis uses theta. Um, yogic meditators will go into a deep theta state and so theta healing helps you to train your brain to get to this theta state and then you connect to divine consciousness now you can call this god allah creator creative all that is source heaven love the universe um you know whatever that word is to describe that energy that you know that divine energy that we all know inside and with the theta brainwave and the divine energy connect intuition opens all of a sudden you can do body scans all of a sudden you can do angel readings all of a sudden you can go talk to trees and plants or you know or someone's higher self um so that's one thing it develops intuition and the second thing is that it helps you to unlock all your subconscious programming which i you know you know really uh, big on because we all need to heal we all come from you know sometimes damaged families sometimes damaged genetic lines sometimes we've had deep heartbreak that's kind of ruined us and and it creates all these limited beliefs inside like love hurts love is damaging or you know i'm always going to be poor or only you know rich people can succeed in life and all these limiting programs actually um, keep our reality locked in a in in a limited world. So, and because we're infinite, abundant, amazing beings, we've got to unlock all those limiting programs so that we can return back to our truth. So that's that's also exciting. So it's got a healing component. And the third thing is is that you learn to manifest. You know, we're creative beings. We're here to manifest in life. Um, so it's looking about 
what it is that you want to create, learning to like do you know, visualizations to create it. And at the same time, learning to notice all the limiting beliefs that come up around your manifestation so that you can unlock them so that you can move forward you know, faster. I mean, I'm sure you've had it. You've like, okay, I want to manifest for, I don't know, 20 new clients a week. Okay. And it's like you manifest for it. You can go up, you do a visualization, maybe you do a vision board. And then all these limiting beliefs that come up and those limiting beliefs stop it. So it might be that oh, no one likes me. Uh, I'll be rejected. People don't think I'm good enough and all your limitations will come up. Um, so you need to clear them so that you can then be vibrating at a place to match your manifestation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would love to talk a little bit more about limiting beliefs because everybody's got them, whether they are really big or kind of subtle. Because, and sometimes the subtle ones are harder to clear because we think, oh, that isn't reality. That's a limiting belief. Or is that a reality? Or it, it's the subtle ones sometimes that are hard. Can you talk a little bit about some of the limiting beliefs that you have cleared through this work and how you did that? Yeah, absolutely. So one of my limiting beliefs is because I come from farmers. On my mother's side of the family, they're all farmers. You know, they wake up early in the morning. They work hard all day long. They work seven days a week. They're farmers. They work hard to make money. They work hard to make money. So I had this ringing inside of me, work hard to make money, work hard to make money, work hard to make money. So then I used to just work six days a week for like minimum wage because all I could do was work hard to make money. (laughs) Right. It was exhausting because it was just like, that's all you do. That's what you do to survive. That's what you do to make money. You just work hard to make money. So, yeah, I had, I, once I recognized that, I was like, oh, that's all my farmer stuff. That's all my farmer beliefs. And I don't need to have that anymore because you know what? I'm not a farmer. I'm not, I'm not, I want to carry that consciousness through anymore. So I went into the theta state. I get to the divine energy and I just asked, can we clear this now? Can we release the belief I have to work hard for money? I felt it lift off me and I felt all, all these ancestors or farmers clear from me. And then I got this new information coming down uh, about what it is to, to, to um, create abundance with ease and grace. And so that's my new, my new state, creating abundance with ease and grace. And that's made me cut down my work hours. It's allowed me to increase my wage. You know, so it's created such a different reality for me because I'm no longer locked into that old paradigm. So that's been a big belief. And the other big belief I had was around sugar, okay? So I used to like sugar, 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 sugar. And I was like, you know what? A lot of, you know, sugar beliefs are around love, not having enough love, using sugar, love as a substitute and all this kind of stuff. So I worked on all my love, sugar belief, beliefs, right? And it got better but didn't quite clear. And I was like, what is this? And I remember just growing up, connecting to Beta, connecting to, you know, uh, the divine energy I was like why hasn't this shifted and my belief was was that sugar gets me closer to God and that's why I couldn't give it up oh isn't that interesting so interesting so I and I got taken back to a memory of going to Sunday school and there always been cake so sugar got me closer to God it sure did yeah it did so why would I want to give that up if I'm a spiritual being and I want to get close to God I better eat that sugar you know uh. I love what the two examples you gave. One was very rational, so to speak, and one is very irrational. And I like that you use both of those because it, to be a farmer, you do have to work long hours. You do, it is sun up to sundown. It is. It is true. And it's not that there's anything not true about that belief. You yeah. do have to work hard to make money I guess some of it is the definition of hard you know because I work hard but I love my work so it's not a burden and I'm sure you work hard to make money but it's joyful hard it's it's absolutely and and, uh, and interesting that belief gave me good work ethic so I use that now today but I don't have to use it as the burden but the ethics is still there so yeah yes Yes, absolutely. And also you are choosing, you know, to limiting those hours and to shifting that around. But that belief came from something that was logical. As a farmer, you do have to work hard to make money. And then I love that the cake example, it was an irrational childhood belief. And we all have those, oh my gosh, we all have those crazy beliefs. And I just love that you use that as an example, because I think it shows people and illustrates 
it doesn't matter. Things can be irrational and they can get stuck in there and they can limit us. We just have to figure